Okay, so tonight's <clears throat> uh, study is on the ministry of Jesus and how long was it? And it's commonly believed to be three and a half years, if you know anything about it, or if you. But there's there's not a whole lot of studies done on it, <clears throat> and uh, one of the reasons why it isn't is because it, nobody has been able to nail it down. And so, uh, this, first of all, I'll start off with a summary <clears throat> of the whole message here so that you kind of know where it's going <clears throat> so i'm going to start off with the prophecy of daniel chapter 9 27 and that's where the three and a half years comes from then uh i'm gonna there's a, a section on the three three gospels only suggest about a one-year ministry and those of course those three are the synoptic gospels then early church fathers believed in about a one-year ministry then uh, historical attempts to harmonize the four Gospels fail. <clears throat> then Michael Rood, he brought out a book called The Chronological Gospels, which this whole study is based on. And in it, it's the holy days that track time and which are the key to synchronize all four Gospels. Now, how many Passovers were there? Was there one, two, three, or four? And in that section, I'll also talk about a critical edit that, that I'm suggesting or Michael Rood suggesting <clears throat> to make everything come into sync. <clears throat> now, then I'm going to cover the detail of the days in the Gospel of John's first few chapters. And then Jesus was required to keep three holy days in Jerusalem each year. And about a manuscript without this verse of John 6, 4, which is contentious. And then 11, the miracle of the loaves cannot be in the time frame of a Passover. And there is no record of six supposed missing holy days. <clears> then <throat> Luke's transfiguration linked with tabernacles in the Gospel of John. A little bit about the birth of Christ and the acceptable year of the Lord and historical, sabbatical and jubilee years, <clears throat> which gave the Israelites two free years for John and Jesus to teach. And is there a jubilee soon approaching? And I also have a spreadsheet that is available to anyone that wants it that kind of makes it you can glance at everything and understand how all the gospels sync up with each other and also some specific dates uh, in, in, uh of occurrences of events in our lord's ministry that are are kind of curious to uh to know when when exactly they were okay so i'm starting off with <clears throat> the ministry of jesus how long was it the study of the length of christ's public ministry is not something that is often taught. I think there are two reasons for this. I think the main reason is that no one can figure it out with much accuracy. And as a result, I think it is thought of as, as not important, but I believe both points are wrong. Scholars can't decide if the ministry was one year long or three and a half years long. They've been trying for 1600 years to harmonize the gospels and establish firm dates, but they can't do it. This is an embarrassment to Christianity. Surely it may not affect the faith of current believers, but I believe it helps prevent unbelievers from coming to the truth, especially our youth. They are taught by their teachers of higher learning that the Bible is unreliable, contradictory, and fictitious. And our failure on this issue does not help our cause. This also applies to many aspects of the Bible. And we must do more to defend the accuracy of the Bible to restore everyone's faith in it. This study is an effort to do just that. All right. The prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9, 27, where the three and a half years comes from. The public teaching ministry of Jesus is often said to be three and a half years, but there is no hard evidence for this. It is primarily based on a certain interpretation of a prophecy found at Daniel 9, 27, which says in the King James Version, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week 
and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. End of quote. One can quickly find dozens of pages of interpretation of this verse on the internet. This verse of Daniel deserves its own study. It gets very complex, but one interpretation is that this verse is referring to Jesus being crucified in the midst or middle of a week. And as one day represents one year in Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, it is believed that Jesus was crucified halfway through the last seven year period or three and a half years into his ministry. The end of Jan Daniel chapter nine foretells a time when the ruined Jerusalem of Daniel's day would be rebuilt and when Messiah will come. He speaks of a number of sevens or weeks of time. He speaks of seven weeks, 62 weeks and one week totaling 70 weeks and also an event that happens in the midst of a week. But in certain prophecies, a day stands for a year. So 70 weeks really means 490 years. And so, because Daniel's prophecy started somewhere around the mid 400s BC, all of his prophecy should have been fulfilled around the time of Christ's life. But there is debate on whether or not the final week or seven years has been fully fulfilled and the exact meaning of the phrase midst of the week. Some believe this prophecy refers to a to the new covenant that Messiah <clears throat> came to make with his people, but that he was crucified halfway through or in the midst of what was supposed to be a seven year ministry. But others believe that the ministry was not cut short, but that the phrase in the midst of the week means Christ was crucified on a Wednesday, the literal middle of a week. One way or another, to base a three and a half year ministry based on one very obscure verse of prophecy is going way out on a limb. Whereas looking at the details of all four gospels should give us a much better idea of how long the ministry was. Three gospels only suggest about a one year ministry. <clears throat> The internal evidence of Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not lead us to a three and a half year, years of activity by Jesus. The Passover is the most holy day of the year, and yet all three synoptic gospels only record it happening once. That means that Christ's ministry could have been even less than one year. Now, just because only one Passover was recorded, that does not guarantee that there was only one Passover during our Lord's ministry. But it certainly doesn't support the theory that Jesus traveled four times to Jerusalem for Passover and encountered the Pharisees and their death plots many times. Surely there would have been much to write about that isn't recorded. But having said that, John's gospel does confirm that Jesus observed more than one Passover. But we will find that even John's gospel does not support four Passovers. Here is a quick summary of how each gospels synchronize with each other. <clears throat> Luke, in his gospel, emphatically states in his very third verse that his record is accurate and consecutive. He states at chapter 1-3 in the concordant version, it seems good to me also, having fully followed all accurately from the very first, to write to you consecutively. So that is a good start. Mark's gospel is shorter and focuses on Jesus' role as servant, and so leaves out many of the details of Luke's gospel. But everything he does include confirms Luke's chronological order. John's early gospel narrative is much different than the stories in the synoptics, but nevertheless, it follows a straightforward chronology that can be tied perfectly well into all the synoptics, except for one verse, and that's John 6, 4, which reads, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. This will be examined at length a little later. Matthew's chronology is the only exception to the rule. His chronology 
syncs with the other three at the beginning and at the end of his gospel. But the events get jumbled from each other in his chapters 8 through 13. But there seems to be good explanation for this. Instead of an exact chronology, Matthew is more interested in grouping themes together. His gospel is divided into five major discourses, which are the Sermon on the Mount, the Mission Discourse, the Parabolic Discourse, the Church Discourse, and the End Times Discourse. As an example, we see that Matthew strings about 10 healings together in chapters 8 and 9 and about 10 parables together in chapter 13. We need not think that this must mean that all these events immediately happened one after the other. Except for those cases, even Matthew follows the same order as Mark, Luke, and John. In overview, we find in studying all the events of Jesus' life, from his baptism to his death, is that the synoptic gospels all fit into one smooth, continuous chronology. According to many biblical scholars, if just the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are studied, the public ministry of Jesus seems to be no longer than a little over one year. And I submit that if it were not for that one verse in John, all four Gospels would harmonize, but that one verse makes harmonizing all four Gospels impossible. Now, let's look at the history of thought. The early church fathers believed in about a one-year ministry. The Catholic Encyclopedia, as only one of many examples, under Chronology of the Life of Jesus Christ, states that Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen, Lactantius, and all the early church fathers of the second and third centuries, as well as Philastrius, Gardentius, Evangrius, Orosius, Ephraim, and half a dozen other theologians all concur that the ministry of Christ lasted about one year. So who were these men? St. Clement taught in Alexandria. Oregon was one of his students. Tertullian was a prolific early Christian author. Lactantius was an early Christian author who advised Constantine I. St. Gardentius was a bishop and a theologian and author of many letters and sermons. St. Philastrius was also a bishop and present at the Synod of 381 and who composed a catalog of heresies. Evagrius Ponticus was one of the most influential theologians of the late fourth century church. Erosius was a priest, historian, theologian, and student of Augustine. Ephraim the Syrian was a deacon and prolific, prolific hymnographer and theologian. Now, none of their writings are inspired, but they were the most brilliant Christian minds of the time. And what it does prove is that this belief is not recently manufactured. In fact, quite to the contrary, the three and a half year ministry belief did not gain popularity until Eusebius promoted it in the fourth century. Up until that time, every church father and historian for the first 300 years after Christ either clearly stated or never contradicted that Jesus' ministry was about one year. The only exception I could find to that was a Wikipedia article on Irenaeus, who was a bishop and famous anti-Gnostic and who died about 202 AD. He taught against a one-year ministry, but he also taught that Jesus was still teaching while over 40 years of age. <clears throat> but regardless of this early unanimity of thought, the three and a half year teaching of Eusebius gained sway. I suppose because he is regarded as one of the most learned Christians of the fourth century and is known as the father of church history. Now note, not to be confused with a church father because he was hundreds of years later. He produced a 435 page book called Ecclesiastical History 
which I presume taught this doctrine and led to its popular acceptance. Okay, now, historical attempts to harmonize the four Gospels fail. According to Wikipedia, Christian scholars have been trying to harmonize the Gospels ever since Eusebius, and they are still trying to do it without success. I discovered that even Sir Isaac Newton tried for years to do it, but couldn't. Here are the highlights of, of the article on Wikipedia. Quote, the gospel accounts show a great deal of overall similarity, but the scholarly process for constructing a detailed harmony is complicated by issues of text or the uniqueness of material in each gospel. Specific issues at times resist distillation into a single harmonized chronology. The first known attempt at harmony was made about AD 160 by Tatian. In the third century, Ammonius of Alexandria developed the forerunner of modern synopsis. In the fifth century, St. Augustine wrote extensively on the subject in his book, Harmony of the Gospels. In the 15th and 16th century, there was new approaches including by John Calvin. And recently there are more, but one way or the other, they, they have failed to reach a complete harmony until I, I came across Michael Rood's book, The, Chronolog the Chronological Gospels. I believe the standard for a chronological study of the, of the Bible should be Michael Rood's The Chronological Gospels. This study is based on that book and videos produced by him. He was finally able to perfectly synchronize all four gospels with a, as little as a very important one word edit. Uh, that's a little bit jumbled there. What, I, what I'm saying is he was able to perfectly harmonize the gospels if he includes one tiny edit. Rood was born and raised at a a, an American. He is an ex-Marine and ex-Baptist preacher. He is now living in Israel as a to Torah obedient Christian. Uh, <clears throat> uh, he has been teaching this doctrine since at least 1999, but he did not invent it. During my studies into this subject, I came across other material that supports the same theory. For example, a book written by a Lant Carpenter as far back as 1831. So the theory is not new. And of course, its proponents would argue that it never was new, but that the original one year plus ministry was changed to a three year plus ministry hundreds of years after the death of Christ. So how does Michael Rood figure out this puzzle? <clears throat> the holy days track time and synchronize all four gospels. Time can be measured by the the mention of passing seasons and major festivals associated with them. For instance, the Passover is on the 15th day after the first new moon, after the first day of spring. That makes it anywhere from early April to early May. That moon is considered the first new moon of the year. The Feast of Pentecost is held 50 days after Passover. That means it is held somewhere between late May to late June. The Feast of Tabernacles is on the 15th day after the seventh new moon, making it anywhere from late September to late October. Hanukkah is a feast not mentioned directly by name in the Gospels, and it is not a commanded festival, but it seems to be inferred in John's Gospel, and it is celebrated in December. So, if and when the Gospels mention these festivals, we can track the activities of Jesus throughout the months of the year and hopefully harmonize them and figure out the length and sequence of Christ's activities. Now, the number of Passovers, were there one, two, three, or four? And more about this critical edit. As mentioned, all of these festivals, the, synop the Synoptic Gospels only mention one Passover, and that is the final one at the time of Christ's crucifixion. But the Gospel of John is different. He records three Passovers. Unfortunately for proponents of the three and a half year ministry, that still only guarantees a little more than two full years. 
But John also records another unnamed festival of the Jews. If this is indeed another Passover, which would make a total of four Passovers, then these proponents are assured of at least three full years. And so a three and a half year ministry is possible. Now, let me list the four verses in order that they that they believe refer to four Passovers. Okay, now I'm going to try to show you these four verses, and I'm, I'm going to go through them one by one, but uh, it'll kind of, kind of give you an idea of where I'm going. And it's, uh, now, this is a little bit, I'm sorry that I should have been more, I should have had a, a different way of doing that. Oh, yeah, I got to put a, something behind you. <laughs> The first, yeah, okay. So you can see the first one there, can you? Yeah. John 2.13 says, And near was the Passover of the Jews. Okay. Now, this festival is the first Passover. Now, not, it's not recorded in any of the synoptics, but all believe this is correct. This is where Jesus drives out the money changers. Now, the second verse we're considering is John 5 1. All right, you can see that. After these things there was a, a festival of the Jews. Now this is the one that the proponents would say it's a Passover but I'm going to show that this festival is most likely Pentecost. And so there's no conflict with the uh, with scripture. I'm this is just a clarification. Now, can you see 6-4 there? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, because I, I can't see my screen now. Okay, 6-4. Now, near was the Passover, the festival of the Jews. Now, I'm going to show that this is incorrect. And this is the edit that I'm talking about. And it, it probably should say, this festival, now near was the tabernacles the, uh, the festival of the jews this is the correction that is required or it needs to be corrected or just remove this verse altogether okay and then there's john 7 2 now near was the jews festival of tabernacles now this here is where john logically informs us of the name of the festival Instead of, see, 6, 4 and 7, 2, they're only one chapter apart. And uh, I, well, I'll get to explaining what I'm trying to get across here. But this is the mix up between uh, Passover and Tabernacles. And then finally, there's John eleven fifty five. Now, near was the Passover of the Jews. This festival is the crucifixion Passover. All four Gospels record this Passover, and there's no conflict over this. Okay, so. I hope that will kind of clue you in a little bit as to where I'm going. But, okay. Now, so John records, might record, four Passovers. But this study will argue that there were only two Passovers during our Lord's ministry. One shortly after Jesus' baptism and the second one at his death. Therefore, two of these verses are not referring to Passovers. Let me explain. First, I will address the so-called second Passover. Once again, John 5.1 reads, After these things, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Okay, I maintain that John's unnamed festival is not a Passover. That is not really controversial, because the Bible does not say that it was. It could literally be any festival of the Jews. And I will shortly suggest what festival it must be. But if it is not a Passover, then that would allow us to limit the ministry to three Passovers and therefore a time period of at most less than three years. Next, I will address the so-called third Passover. John 6, 4 reads in the concordant, Now near was the Passover, the festival of the Jews. Now, it is obviously controversial to delete or even edit a single word of scripture. It is something I normally abhor. 
but sometimes on rare occasion, mistakes in transmission happen over a period of 2000 years. And so if the change of a single word can suddenly make the four gospel narratives fall into sync with each other that have maddeningly resisted their harmonizing by the most brilliant scholars. And if it can help align the gospels with historical events and help reveal the birth and cr crucifixion years of our savior and sync us with the Jubilee years, well then I think we ought to consider this edit. Therefore, this study is proposing that there is a mistake by a scribal copyist in this verse. We believe that only one word needs to be changed to accomplish this harmony. Instead of the word stating that it was a feast of Passover, we believe that the word should be the feast of tabernacles or the whole 10 word verse should be deleted. I will discuss that later as well. If either is correct, then only two Passovers remain. And if there are only two Passovers, one near the beginning and one right at the end of Christ's ministry, then the time frame must be less than two years. So now let me get into the detail of John to support this assertion. Detail of John of the days in John's first few chapters. John often gave exact details as to his chronology. <clears throat> and uh, it's funny, I uh, you know, you read the, the, the gospel and sometimes you gloss over this stuff, but uh, when you look at it verse by verse, uh, you notice how exact the days go by. Note the time references that I will emphasize. <clears throat> Chapter one starts off with John the Baptist coming to bear witness to the light and then the word being made incarnate. The Baptist confronts the priests and Levites at verse 19. Then the next day, verse 29, John beholds the Lamb of God. Then the next day, verse 35, Jesus calls his first disciples. Then the next day, verse 43, Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael end of chapter one. And then on the third day, verse one, they attended a wedding at Cana. Then Jesus goes to Capernaum and does not stay there many days. Verse 12. Then the Passover was near. Verse 13. And so Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. <clears throat> Note that I am not contesting this verse. At this Passover, Jesus confronts the temple merchants and many see him do miracles and believe in his name. End of chapter two. Chapter three then starts off with the story of Nicodemus while Jesus is still in Jerusalem. After this, Jesus leaves Jerusalem, but tarries, verse 22, in Judea while his disciples as they baptize. It is not stated exactly how long Jesus tarries, but chapter four starts off by saying he leaves to go back to Galilee when the Pharisees found out, verse one, that he is still in the area making more disciples. I think we can safely assume that it would not have taken the Pharisees long to find out Jesus was making disciples in that area. So Jesus would not have tarried there long. On their way back, they had to pass through Samaria, where he meets the woman at the well. He agrees to stay there two days, verse 43, before leaving for Galilee. Then Jesus again passes through Cana and heals the official son. John notes at the end of chapter 4 that this is the second miracle Jesus does at Cana connecting the start and end of his journey. So we see how this is sometimes a day by day description of the activities of Jesus and that this whole four chapter time frame, being a return trip from Galilee to Jerusalem for the Passover can only be two months at the most and probably less. And so now we come to the very next verse, which is the first verse of chapter five and it states after this 
there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. According to the three and a half year theory, this unnamed feast day is one of the four required Passovers. But how can this possibly be another Passover when Jesus just returned from a Passover trip in the very previous verse? Are we now to think that in this very next verse, Jesus was headed back to Jerusalem for the Passover again? That would mean that nine or ten months would have passed, and John has recorded absolutely nothing about what happened the rest of that whole year. Does that mean Jesus did nothing of consequence for 10 months? I would hardly think so. In the context of all that has been happening, recorded almost day by day, that seems incredible. And that is why this feast must certainly be Pentecost. Pentecost was held only 50 days after Passover. And it is the next commanded feast that Jesus must attend in Jerusalem. Pentecost makes perfect sense. It is as simple and as plain as that. Jesus had to keep all the God-given Old Testament laws. That means that Jesus was required to go up to Jerusalem for the three annual festivals. In the Old Testament, Yahweh commanded that all men make the three annual pilgrimages to Jerusalem and to appear before him. These three feasts, commonly known in the Christian world as Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles were cornerstone events in the life of faithful Israelites. Passover was in the early spring. Pentecost was 50 days later and Tabernacles followed in the early autumn. Every able male Jew who was to attend these feasts mm -hmm. in Jerusalem or else they were to be cut off from the community of Israel. So even though Jesus may have been risking his life because of the Pharisees, he had to attend these festivals. He could not avoid them. If we figure that this first Passover trip Jesus just finished took five or six weeks instead of the two months I allowed for above, then it was only one or two more weeks before the 50 days was up and Jesus had to return to Jerusalem again. So this unnamed Feast of the Jews must logically be Pentecost. Now, that eliminates another one of the proposed four Passovers in John. Now we can deal with the supposed third Passover. First, let me quickly recap the first few chapters. In chapter 2, Jesus went to Jerusalem for Passover. In chapter 3, he had his dialogue with Nicodemus in Jerusalem and then tarries a while in the area. In chapter 4, Jesus goes home to Galilee. In chapter 5, Jesus returns to Jerusalem for Pentecost in the late spring and confronts the Jews again. So far, John's chronology is running smoothly and orderly, but now something really strange happens. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, After this, Jesus is on a mountain slope in Galilee with 5,000 hungry followers. No problem. According to John, after Pentecost, we should now be sometime in the warm months during a summer crusade, so to speak. But then, very surprisingly, in verse 4, we have deja vu all over again. Three verses later, at John 6, verse 4, states, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. But the last thing Jesus did was to get home from the Pentecost Holy Day. That would have been June. All of a sudden, it's the next April again. How did that happen? And then the next verse goes back to the story again, which seems disjointed. The surrounding 14 verses, before and after that verse, all tell the details of the story of the feeding of the 5,000, except for this one verse. It seems oddly plunked down in the middle of the story, completely out of context. Mm -hmm. And Passover should not be for at least another seven or even 10 months. Are we to believe that a huge period of time just passed when either Jesus did absolutely nothing 
or John didn't bother to report on anything he did, including his obliged trip to the Feast of Tabernacles, something is very wrong here. And if Passover really was nigh, how come John proceeds with the rest of the chapter and says absolutely nothing about Jesus going to Jerusalem or something about the Passover feast itself. If true, he totally ignores that important feast that entire year, except for this 10 word mention. And what is the point of even mentioning it? It has no bearing whatsoever on this story of the feeding of the 5,000 or anything afterwards. In fact, as we shall see, it is in total conflict with the Passover, if it is nigh. If the verse is genuine and three quarters of a year has suddenly passed in three verses, then I am bewildered by the sudden change of pace of John's chronology. As we have read, everything else was written so evenly, orderly, and consecutively. This verse makes no sense, but a little edit will fix everything. And so, if it was tabernacles instead of Passover, a feast of the Jews that was nigh, then it makes sense. Tabernacles was the next obligatory feast day that Jesus must keep in Jerusalem. Tabernacles is also about four months after Pentecost, which gives Jesus the whole summer to do his outdoor ministry. It would also make sense that this feeding of the 5,000 on the mountain slopes took place sometime during late that summer. Not too hot or cold on the mountain slopes in late summer or early fall. But if Passover were nigh, these 5,000 men and their families would be on a mountain slope sometime in March or April, not near so comfortable a time for an outdoor crusade. But actually, <clears throat> my suspicion is that the whole verse, instead of being in need of that one word correction, should just be deleted. As stated, it is out of context with the established flow of the narrative, and it is pointless. In addition, at the start of the next chapter, at John 7, verse 2, it really does say, now near was the Jews' festival of tabernacles. Why would John tell us this festival was near twice in two chapters? Now it makes sense in, verse, in chapter 7, but not in the previous chapter. This whole verse may well be a fabrication inserted by others into the original. Whether it was done with malicious intent or was a misguided edit, I can't say. But this orphaned verse in chapter six not only adds nothing to our understanding of the context, it confuses us. Now, there is one old manuscript in existence without that verse in it. There is at least one historical evidence that supports the deletion of this questionable verse. Greek manuscript number 472 is an 11th century Greek New Testament frag fragment, which was originally housed in Constantinople, but it is now safely protected in Lambeth Palace Library in London, England. In it, the last words of verse three are immediately followed by the first words of verse five. In other words, the questionable verse four was never there. Now, maybe this was an accidental scribal omission, or maybe this is the only accurate copy of the original we still have. 11, the miracle of loaves cannot be in the time frame of Passover. And here is yet two more issues that are very problematic for this questionable verse. If the Passover really was near, then one, Jesus and these 5,000 men would not be sitting around on a mountain slope in Galilee, but instead they would be on their way to Jerusalem as commanded by Yahweh during this feast. And two, Yahweh also commanded that there was to be no leavened bread found anywhere during this feast, which is also called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because the Israelites were commanded by Yahweh 
to cleanse their houses of all leavening and to eat no leavened bread throughout this period. So you see what problem is arising from this miracle from by Jesus. For what it's worth, I found this in Wikipedia. Quote, observant Jews spend the weeks before Passover in a flurry of thorough house cleaning to remove every morsel of chemets from every part of the home, end quote. Chemetz is Hebrew and means leavening in English. So if Passover was anywhere in the near future, Jesus and his followers would, one, not be eating fish sandwiches on hilltops in Galilee. No, they would be, be preparing to go to Jerusalem. And two, Jesus would certainly not be performing a miracle involving the creation of many thousands of puffed up loaves of leavened bread. Making the situation even worse, verse 13 comments that the leftovers were gathered for later use, the latter time being even closer to this supposed feast of unleavened bread. This verse just makes no sense at all. <clears throat> now, there's no record of six supposed missing holy days. If there really were four Passovers during the ministry, that also means there were at least three feasts of Pentecost and three feasts of Tabernacles, totaling 10 in all that Jesus had to keep by traveling to Jerusalem and no doubt being confronted by the scribes, Pharisees and Sadducees. Remember how John said the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him as early as chapter five? And again, in chapter 7, verse 1, John says that Jesus stayed in Galilee and would not go to Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. These two events were within the first eight months of his ministry. A long ministry means that Jesus would have had nine more opportunities. Sorry, a long ministry means that the Jews would have had nine more opportunities to trap and kill Jesus in Jerusalem after his first Passover debut. But very surprisingly, only one more confrontation with them is mentioned in Jerusalem during this supposed three and a half year period. What would Jesus have been doing during these extra two long years? Where were his many thousands of followers? Surely they would have followed him into Jerusalem on all these occasions. Surely Jesus would have encountered the scribes and Pharisees on all these occasions. But if the short ministry is correct, then Jesus only had to escape their clutches one more time at the Feast of Tabernacles before the fatal Passover. And Luke 9.31 does record that second of three trips to Jerusalem. We can now see that this is the same trip that John records in chapter 7 to attend tabernacles. Luke's transfiguration linked with tabernacles in John. Now here is another interesting side issue. There is only one miracle in the public ministry that is told in all four Gospels. And that is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And because of it, we have a sync point to coordinate all four of them. This miracle takes place in Luke chapter 9, verses 10 to 17. And just a little bit later in the chapter is the story of the transfiguration. In this story, Moses and Elijah appear glorified with Jesus, and Peter, for no obvious reason to us Gentiles, says to Jesus, let us make three tabernacles, one each for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. When I was young, I was always curious about exactly what a tabernacle was and why Jesus and why Peter wanted to make three of them. Was Peter supposing that the three of them would live there permanently? But I have since learned that during the Feast of Tabernacles, or booze, as it is also called, the Israelites were commanded to live in small temporary shelters for seven days. So what's my point? As I said, the feeding of the 5,000 is also found in John chapter six, but it is not followed by the story 
of the Transfiguration. Instead, in the next chapter, it really does say the Feast of Tabernacles was near. And that's John 7, 2, where it does say, Now, near was the Jews' festival of tabernacles. So now, combining the two Gospels, we can figure out why Peter wanted to build tabernacles. Even though Luke 9 doesn't tell us that the Feast of Tabernacles was nigh, John's Gospel tells us that it was. So the building of these temporary tabernacles was now appropriate and makes complete sense. Peter was not intending to build permanent residences, but only booths for the eight-day festival. Now, I will return again to the validity of John 6.4 and as to whether or not it should be edited or deleted altogether. To remind you, this is the verse that I said should be changed from near was the Passover to near was tabernacles or the whole verse should be deleted. Normally, it would be less objectionable to change one word than to delete a whole verse. But John 7.2 makes me question that. If John really did write at the beginning of chapter 6 that Tabernacles was near, then why did he write the exact same verse again at the beginning of chapter 7? That doesn't seem likely or make any sense. The birth of Christ. Now, one shorter bit of information, and this is off track my message, but it is interesting. <clears throat> the word Tabernacles may also tip us off as to when Jesus was born. John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. It is usually accepted that Jesus was not born any time in the winter, but September or early October would make sense. I can't go into detail, but the Feast of T Tabernacles has a number of reasons to suspect it as the real birthday of Christ. And why was there no room at the inn? Because Bethlehem is only five miles from Jerusalem, and the area would have been flooded with holy day keepers. But there would have been thousands of these temporary tabernacles. Perhaps Jesus was not born in a manger, but in a tabernacle. An animal stall, traditionally translated as manger, is a small shelter booth, or tabernacle. When the nativity story was originally retold in Hebrew and then translated into Greek and then, of course, into English, it is not hard to imagine that they were trying to express the same sort of small building, but it resulted in the word manger instead of tabernacle. Who knows? And uh, just uh, off track a little bit, again, this, this whole thing about putting the, uh, the harmony of the Gospels together and, and being able to locate the specific years of Jesus' birth and death and so on is, uh, is quite revealing and satisfying instead of, you know, listening to people say, well, maybe it was 4 BC, maybe it was 4 AD, maybe Jesus started at 27 AD, maybe it was 33 AD. We, got, we really got no idea, but it's around plus or minus five years. It's hardly uh, comforting that that is the best our scholarship can do. <clears throat> the acceptable year of the Lord. In Luke 4.16, Jesus either plainly testifies to his one-year ministry or at least strongly suggests it. In Luke, we find a story that is unique to him, which takes place at the very beginning of his ministry, in which Jesus plainly hints at how long his new ministry will take. Luke 4.16 says that one Sabbath, Jesus was in the synagogue and he read Isaiah 61.1, which reads in the concordant, The spirit of my Lord Yahweh is on me because Yahweh anoints me to bear tidings to the humble. He sends me to bind up the brokenhearted, to herald to captives liberty and to the blind, the unclosing of the eyes and to the bound, to take the jubilee, and to herald the acceptable year for Yahweh. We 
just read that Jesus says to herald an acceptable year for Yahweh, not to herald three and a half years, but for one jubilee year. And exactly what does Jesus mean by this acceptable year for Yahweh? This term, which Jesus quotes from Isaiah, is used at no other place in the Bible, but the meaning is clear. It refers to what we find at Leviticus 25.10, which says, And you will hallow the year, the 50th year, and proclaim liberty in the land to all its dwellers. A jubilee year shall this one be for you. Each of you will return to his holding, and each of you shall return to his family. Now, this Jubilee year is not to be confused with a sabbatical year. That is a, a, a one year that occurs every seven years. The food producing lands rest and all debts are canceled. Deuteronomy 15, one to six. But after seven of these sabbatical years on the 50th year is a Jubilee year. Leviticus 25 to 55. The highlights are that the land has a second year's rest. The title of the land reverts back to its original owner and all slaves are liberated. That was exactly what a large part of the message of Jesus was all about. For instance, Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ frees us. Stand firm then, and be not again enthralled with the yoke of slavery. Historical, sabbatical, and jubilee years. According to William Whiston's footnotes to Josephus, 24 BC was a sabbatical year, and 23 BC was a jubilee year. That would mean that 27 AD was a sabbatical year, and 28 AD was a jubilee year. And who was William Whiston? He succeeded his mentor, Sir Isaac Newton, as professor of mathematics at the University of Cambridge. But in 1710, he lost his professorship and was expelled from the university as a result of his unorthodox religious views, which were because Whiston rejected the notion of eternal torment in hellfire. He viewed it as absurd and cruel, as well as an insult to God. What especially pitted him against church authorities was he viewed the Trinity as a lie. After extensive research, he found the origin of the Trinity to be teaching to be pagan. Now, two free years for John and Jesus to teach. How was it that the 4,000 and the 5,000 men with their families were available to travel and listen to John the Baptist and Jesus? Normally, every day was a work day except the Sabbath. And on that day, the rabbis commanded that the people travel very little and carry almost nothing. But God had given the Israelites something much better. They had these sabbatical and jubilee years two full years in which they were commanded to stop working. This is why so many thousands were free to roam. No farmers were planting or harvesting. Is the Jubilee year approaching? If we don't understand this, we fail to see how Jesus' public ministry only went through one cycle of the Lord's feast days and how the events of those days fulfilled prophecy and foreshadowed the future and what it means for us. One cycle makes sense. Doesn't Jesus going through three cycles of holy days seem redundant? And if there were three years of ministry, the final one could not have been in the Jubilee year. And by not accurately pinpointing these years, we fail to recognize that we are fast approaching another Jubilee year in 2028. Now, that does not mean I am predicting the end of the world. I have been listening to people like Hal Lindsey predicting the end of the world since 1970 when I was 18 years old. But I think this is a significant date that we should at least be aware of. And that's 
Amen. <laughs> so the only other thing I mentioned, like I said, there's a, there's a spreadsheet and Excel file available to anyone who wants it that kind of lays out all four gospels side by side with about 40 events of uh, Jesus' life in the other column that uh, coordinates where you can find that event in either of the four gospels, if it's in one of those gospels, and how they coordinate with each other chronologically. Um, oh, and I do have a little bit more one for interest sake, I'll add this. For interest sake, according to Michael Rood, these are events regarding Jesus. Jesus was born on the Feast of Tabernacles, September 26, 3 BC. He was baptized on February 16th, AD 27, which was a sabbatical year. Uh, he kept the first Passover on April 11th, AD 27, and he was crucified the following Passover, or just before the following Passover, on Wednesday, April 28th, AD 28, which was a Jubilee year. He was resurrected on Saturday, a Sabbath, May 1st, AD 28, and the Holy Spirit descended on Pentecost Sunday, June 20th, A.D. 28. So, yeah, just about filled up an hour. Uh, okay. But if there's any questions, uh, I'll be happy to try and uh, answer them. Or if anybody, if anybody wants the whole study, um, actually, I, I can make it available. To Dan, maybe Dan might want to put it on his website. I, I don't know if, if not, I can send it to you directly. And uh, I don't know if you think that was a waste of time <laughs> or, or not. I mean, it's a lot of that's a a lot of rigmarole, sort of. But uh, anyways, uh, maybe things like that intrigue my mind as to wanting to know exact. I'm, I'm happier with exact dates instead of saying, yeah, Jesus was born plus or minus four years. And uh, we don't know if his ministry was one year or three and a half years or seven years or, uh, and, uh, you know, on and on. It's satisfying to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I've read over this a number of times and, and, and I, I don't see anything wrong with it as, as I look at it. Yeah, you know? well, really, so, it's, it, you know, outside of changing, you can change as little as one word, and then it fits together. But yeah. I found it interesting you know, to read about uh, Sir Isaac Newton, you know, one of the most brilliant minds of all time. And, of course, you know, all those scientists, or most all those scientists back then, they were all Christians. Not only Christians, but very involved Christians with their faith. And, yeah. uh, and they studied stuff like this. And, uh, and he couldn't make it work. And, and you can't make it work unless because it's actually a mistake. Uh, but it's, it's a one word mistake uh, that change it to tabernacles and everything can then fall into harmony. It's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's worth your time to read a little bit and see that. I've been looking at, uh, just to tell you this, um, we call it the triumphal entry. Yeah. And I have a chronological uh, book on chronology downstairs. And it's rather old. I don't know. Maybe it's the same fella. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Root, is that his name? Rude. Yeah. Rude. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, uh, so, and like I say, and what I've got there, you know, are his highlights of, uh, of the book. And that's yes. uh, good enough for me. But this book is uh, 387 pages. And, you know, and, I, and I, I still, you know, I haven't I haven't gone through it page by page, but yes. you go through the, every verse of the new of the New Testament or at least the Gospels. And I think maybe Acts and may and Revelation, perhaps. Uh, but anyway, detailing 
how and how exactly how he figures it out. Well, like I say, he he actually uses NASA, NASA uh, time charts. You know, they, they they know when the new moon was and wasn't. Yes, three BC or or five hundred BC. They 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 can they can figure that out, and so he knows exactly in except you don't traditionally you don't know what year jesus was born and what year he died but if anyway he but once you pick on a year like ad 27 or 28 they know exactly to the minute to the second uh when the ro the moon rose over jerusalem and started the the new moon and the new month and <laughs> therefore the cycle of the uh festivals and so on and so knowing that then you can start nailing down uh, specific dates and like I say John some of those days you know he nails down day by day by day uh, and and so he you know he anyway the, the book nails down almost to the day every event of Jesus life so anyway yeah you say you have read his stuff or you or you I, I don't know if it's him or not it's not oh. 300 and some pages oh, okay but at any rate it's I find the chronology very very eye-opening yeah like i said that there was a guy named lant 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 carpenter i think it was name. yeah and he goes back into the 1800s or something like that i said and uh he I, and i i didn't read his book but uh i i think it's available online and uh yeah tim tim haley would have it probably yeah <laughs> so, and uh, well dan i appreciate this it's it, it's good to get you you know, I, I, I've been trying to show the folks that uh, you got to research it to make it your own. Yeah, 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 and it certainly it does become your own way <laughs> when you go into that that kind of detail. Yeah, it just uh, it just takes time. So God bless you. Have a great rest of the week. Now in the realm of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Good night. Good night, Dan.